what does the Eminence and Shadow do best? Action, plot, character development, season with classic Eminence and Shadow humor. We have a chick with a chick that reveals what happened with this vamp chick. We got girls kissing and more equality of violence. You can't really ask for that much more in the Eminence and Shadow, or can we? Guys, in this video, this is going to be spoilers. So if you guys are all about equality of violence, please hit the like button. When you think of episodes, arcs, and entire seasons of an anime, we want to see something fresh, different, in each preceding episode complementing each other. So in episode 1, we had Sid Kagano and Ash Shadow take the spotlight like a true MC he is and carry the punchline. In this episode, we get a more character-centric episode that's not Shadow or Sid Kagano related. It includes a few more plot surprises that has all the hallmarks of a classic anime arc and one that you've probably seen from one of your favorite animes. Even the White Devil himself caught some fun screen time to only get slaughtered as the opener. Sometimes character insight into characters, you know, that quite frankly no one really cares about, it can be kinda annoying. But in this case, for the White Devil, he is the perfect setup for the punchline. The White Devil was a dude that had a morality of a bandit archetype. Now that means that he's still pretty much a bad guy, but he still has characteristics that made him a human. But all of a sudden, when he went out his way to try to ensnare and catch the Blood Queen, it was a bit too much for him and he became the one ensnared. It's funny because he's a slave now. And his name is the White Devil. I'm sure the creator was going for this mass murdering, prey on the weak type of fellow. I love the carryover from Shadow's thievery of Mary's punchlines. They're typical cliche lines that are so good that Shadow almost busted a mental nut in the previous episode. So let's rewind a bit. We still got this tyrant juggernaut in the spirit fox Yukime. So how the hell are they going to make the story interesting? Yukime thanks Shadow for saving all their hoes, and Juggernaut passes up a fight with both Shadow and Yukime to beat up some vamps. I mean, when a 1000 year phenomenon occurs, you can't really pass up that opportunity to beat up some roided up vamps, right? This is Juggernaut's chance to test some grown man strength, and he just rushes into the damn Crimson Tower to go find the Blood Queen. And Juggernaut will show us what true equity entails. But in the episode, we won't see Yukime again. No matter how funny, slice of life, or happy-go-lucky you make a story with your beloved characters, plot matters. And the main plot needs to stay interesting. That includes expanding the insights into the main plot and creating a more compelling mystery. I don't know about you guys. I'm good for one good slice of life episode. After that, somebody better be getting kidnapped, murdered, or just getting their asses handed to them. There needs to be something dramatic, drawing tension. That's what I want from anything I watch, really. So this is what Beta does for us. So the scene takes us to where Shadow Garden is, which is inside the Crimson Tower. They're inside this library, and she presents this mystery of how the Cult of Diablos came across all this advanced technology and how it relates to this current arc. So the demon power that that super drug that the Cult of Diablos has been taking and the progenitor vampire apparently has the same ancestral background. So the demon, vampires, same ancestors. Well, that can sound super compelling, but so what? Whether it's extremely important or not, Beta Scene does give us that plot insight. And of course, the plot device in our favorite violent heroine slides into the Crimson Tower the same way Rose, I mean, excuse me, 666 keeps trying to slide in and Sid's slime juices. No lie, Rose Oriana is a great character. She's used perfectly for that romance that can never be type of trope. I love the way that the show uses Alexia in a similar way to make fun of all the saturated get the lead girls poon trope. It's actually pretty funny how the show uses that harem trope but incorporates meaningful relationships at the same time and at the same time also find twists to make those things funny. 
So Mary and Claire slide into the Crimson Tower like a girl that's never had to slide into a DM before. So they end up unpleasantly clashing bodies like that one time Rose and Alexia fell on top of Natsume. So Mary and Claire, they have a who are you moment with Shadow Garden and of course it's Shadow Garden. Shadow Garden knows everything about Mary and Claire and that complicates things because Sid and Claire are siblings. And, you know, Beta just can't just whack her. So all those characters, they kind of have a moment and then they review their purposes behind why they're there in the Crimson Tower. And of course, Mary and Claire are trying to get to the Blood Queen and Shadow Garden is there to just get insight and info as to how it relates to the cult of Diablos. Mary and Claire end up dipping out cause they don't really want any piece of Shadow Garden anyways. And Beta hints at this utopian ideal kind of trope. You know, before they leave, Beta mentions to Mary about a haven. It's a foreshadowing moment and it hints at Mary's obvious background as it relates to vampires as she is the vampire hunter. Just think about Mary's introduction as a character. She's clearly displayed to be a good guy. So even though they hint at Mary having some secrets, I mean, that part is already obvious because she's a fresh and new character. The real turn of events is she somehow ends up being a bad guy, but very unlikely. So the scene skips ahead again and Mary and Claire link their peers together and they take down each of these NPC vamps Mary teases her secret background story. Then the father of all tyrants arrives and starts smashing down every vamp. Every vampire got that B Shonen vibe. So Juggernaut teaches them a lesson by impaling them where they don't want to be impaled. There's a big vamp secret guys. You kill them by destroying their hearts. Claire and Mary are watching all this go down behind some walls and they're pretty much like, that guy. He looks like a guy that clearly hates women. They try to dip, but but Juggernaut surprises them with his big giant sword. He does what another man has done to Claire before and abuses her face. <laughs> Mary does what every good thoughtful friend would do and checks on Claire's HP levels. As her back was turned, too bad Juggernaut wasn't done showing these ladies What's it like to be equal? So he pulls out a big sharp stick and slices her up and punishes her for letting her guard down. Claire heroically gets back up and shows her the power of femininity and stabs him in the foot. Claire then returns the favor to check on Mary's HP levels, but her HP levels is near red. It's clear that the giant man with the sharp metal stick juggernaut did quite the number on her. Claire tries to heal her like putting on a band-aid on a shotgun wound, and Mary's like, this will take a turn in the horniest ways for our viewers, and she forces herself on Claire's lips. With China's censorship, this scene turned hentai really quick. Claire's all like, but I'm here for my brother. This causes everyone's erection to go limp, but Mary's limp body goes Super Saiyan Red Vamp mode. Like she's about to do something special, but she forgets that a man three times her size is still three times her size, and they tangle with Juggernaut's big sharp stick. And this is the moment everything slowed down when their lives pretty much flashed before their eyes, cause they knew, and we knew, these girls f***ed up. That is not until Shadow shows up, and Shadow kicks Juggernaut out into the next episode. He hits him with Mary's own punchlines. Both Mary and Claire are perplexed by Shadow doing Shadow things and surprisingly helping them by saving them. So they end up moving on the plot because another man saved them. So they both just end up nonchalantly just carrying on on the episode and carrying on the plot. And this is where Mary's backstory is revealed. I sucked you off, Claire. Because I'm a vampire. That Blood Queen story is the good old rewritten history. Blood Queen was actually a good guy doing good things that wanted to create this haven. And that haven is just a metaphor for this coexistence of human and vamps living in harmony. But the story takes a turn because it wasn't until this toxically masculine vampire Crimson instigated this whole massacre event with the Blood Queen. 
this Blood Queen who couldn't evolve like the other vampires. She still couldn't stand in the light. She still couldn't get rid of her thirst for blood. And it wasn't until Crimson, he gave her the craziest drop of blood and that shit was like cracked to her. And she killed humanity for three straight days until she decided to up and offed herself. That blood crack was so good she couldn't disappear and Mary had to be the one to watch over her body. But Crimson showed up and he was pretty much like, this is what us toxically masculine men do. He slashes Mary's head off. So Crimson and the Beast Shonen boys, they end up taking care of the sleeping blood queen. And they're sitting there for that next 1000 year prophecy where the red moon event takes place and this time crimson would manipulate the blood queen again to essentially take over the world so this is the moment at the ending of the story where mary gives us this whole bleak vibe like it's a very dire moment right now what can they do this sucks but this is where claire steps in as she is the hero's journey of this episode and of this moment playing that cliche role and saying all the cliche things like we're gonna save the blood queen and we're gonna build her haven because that's what best buddies are for i mean they already locked lips meanwhile shadow finds himself at the location of his true goal the crimson towers loot there's more loot here than five of el chapo's stash houses not only is there a ton of loot, but there's this dope painting of what I'll call the slumbering masculinity. Shadow states that he might have seen his sister earlier when he kicked Juggernaut, but he's still so focused on saying Mary's lines that he probably didn't notice. And he's pondering how he wants to end this current arc. He still only knows this whole Blood Queen lore at face value, so he's expecting to fight the final boss but then for this specific arc he wants to do things a little bit differently and he wants to end it and not just another epic tardy arrival of him just showing up and fighting the boss at the end he wants to prematurely do a little bit of i am atomic so at the cliche scene of the villain's moment of truth so this gets to pretty much the last couple scenes of the episode where it's the villain's moment of truth of having that W before eventually losing later. So it's a very, very nice scene of Crimson having the heart of the Blood Queen and shoving that shit inside that Sid lookalike to bring back the sleeping Blood Queen. But as all this is going down, the music is playing, the dramatic feeling is all there, the tension is there, this one big moment is gonna happen, but he just loses the shadow in one fell swoop and it ends very anticlimactically. But however, the Blood Queen's heart falls to the ground. So it actually ends with a little bit of a cliffhanger. What's cool about the scene is even though it gives us a kind of an anticlimactic ending, it gives us still something to kind of think about and it's the Blood Queen's heart which didn't blow up. So there's a chance for her to come back and then there's also Yukime and Juggernaut probably still falling off the Crimson Tower as we speak. So there's still a few things to really think about of where the story will take us next. What makes the Eminence of Shadow so damn special is the creators. Knowing exactly how to recreate all these truly classic anime plots and bringing in the same kind of characters to pretty much make fun of it and poke fun of it and doing it all without being like super cringe, being like super slapstick like and just in general take away all the good tension that the story creates. The Eminence of Shadow, they have this fine balance between all that and that's what makes it very good. That Crimson scene was perfectly executed like the big villain is actually gonna get his way and this anime always does action scenes very very well. Even for the gag kind of fights like when Sid fought Rosariana and everything kind of slowed down, the way that that was done, it was really fun and compelling too because it felt like it could have been a, a real fight. But they just made more light of it and just make fun of it because it just wants to be this beat up NPC. And using this current episode's example of when Claire and Mary fought Juggernaut, that was a real action sequence and they used the drama of slowing down moments during fights. Like that that whole slowing down thing is so cliche, but the Eminence of Shout does it so damn well because that's what all these animes do. They slow down all the fights. The Monday Man fight versus Iris, 
fight that was incredible how they sequence like these scenes like this anime's animation isn't like super blow you out of this world but it's good enough in how they present it and how they kind of storyboard it it's actually very compelling and very fun to watch. To me, this episode brought everything that episode one didn't. It developed characters, advanced the plot, and gave the main plot with the Cult of Diablos more insight. It portrayed a classic anime plot with Mary being that plot device, explaining the Blood Queen story. And we got to see Claire for the first time spearhead and be the main hero of an episode and be the main character in place of the previous episode Sid or Shadow as that main character. So that gives us a whole fresh new perspective and more scenes of getting to know Claire more. And she has this whole obliviousness to her as a character. And she obviously has these little funny sibling complex things that they kind of mess around with. And of course Shadow gave us one of the funniest endings to a fight that the anime hasn't showed us before. Just prematurely nuking the whole damn arc just like that but of course there's other characters that's not the blood queen that you know this arc is still take us in a different direction i mean we can always have a last boss kind of battle right we had at least three of those in the first season so it's very true so the first two episodes so far is giving us a fresh perspective an entertaining and compelling perspective and all the while keeping that Eminence and Shadow humor. There's all these little fun twists that Eminence and Shadow uses and it creates a very palpable comedic irony. Guys, this is my favorite anime and I've read up the manga up to this point so I like the anime more than I do the manga. I haven't read the light novel so I can't really comment there so I'll let you guys say those things in the comment section. But as an anime, this show to me, it's a one of a kind. It's not replaceable to me. It's like what I say with the Chainsaw Man manga and the Tatsuki Fujimoto secret sauce. There's just a special flavor to that manga and the Eminence of Shadow anime has that same characteristics where it's just, it's specifically told in a way and it made fun in a way that only the Eminence of Shadow can do. It just has such a unique blend of humor with actually building these same kind of classic anime plots and i think it's just it's just perfect it's just a perfect show at least for me and i hope it is for you guys too because i enjoyed it a lot so let me know what you guys thought about this episode what is your favorite scenes guys was it the kissy kiss scene i would love to know what you guys thought so do me a favor guys hit the like button subscribe to the channel if you guys haven't already check out my blog at otakusen.com and i appreciate you guys watching Guys, yo.